podcast « Repousser les limites ». Votre animateur, JF Dussault, s'entretiendra avec des athlètes d'endurance et collaborateurs qui gravitent autour de la course en sentier et bien plus encore. Abonnez-vous, partagez l'épisode et bonne écoute. Bienvenue à Repousser les Limites. Uh, this week is a very special episode. I do have a guy from Colorado. Uh, he's the founder of Iron Far. He was a long time the chief editor. Now he's editor. He run ultras for more than 20 years. He's the author of the best-selling book, uh, ultra book reference that I know that is called Relentless Forward Progress. So, Brian Powell, welcome on the podcast, and thanks a lot to accept the invitation. Jean-Francois, thank you so much for having me on. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this. Yes, thank you. Pleasure for me, too. So, how did the sport arrive in your life? Uh, if we're talking about ultra running, uh, it's very specific in that I, I ran trails when I was uh, in high school and college. And after college, I moved to the big city. As many people do, I moved to Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, and uh, I didn't have a, a car, but I still loved trail running. So I remember finding a trail running group online, the, the, the beginning of the internet, uh, and found the Virginia Trails uh, Running Club and went, found them and decided to write them and join them for a run out in the mountains. Just was waiting on a street corner in, uh, in Washington, D.C. at five in the morning and someone put, picked me up and took me to the mountains. And uh, it turns out they were all ultra runners. I didn't know at the time, but uh, I think my first run with them was maybe an 18 mile run uh, wow. out in the Shenandoah mountains and a uh, great group of people, a group of people that eventually became my mentors on that run and uh yeah fell in love with ultra running really quick because it meant i got to do more of what i already loved which was trail run okay so you have a background of road running too and i think you run in school in high school like the athletic yes i ran uh, cross country and track in uh in high school and college though in college they made me a sprinter of all things okay <laughs> so <laughs> So do you think that helps you to be better runner in trail uh, after this? I think so in a couple ways. First of all, just having, I've been a runner for 31 years now. So uh, I have a, a very deep background in running physically. Um, yeah. Having done the hard workouts and training in my youth, uh, I think still helps. I was never an, an elite athlete, but I was a strong athlete and, I think that carries forward. And then kind of funnily enough, I don't know if it's because I was a sprinter or uh, being a sprinter just confirmed it, but having some quick turnover, not, not that I'm sprinting to a finish, but having quicker turnover or being comfortable that if I catch my toes on a rock that I can, can recover uh, has been an advantage, not so much in ultra marathons, but in short trail races, just to maybe be a little more aggressive running okay okay nice so when you start trail running did you did you continue your track routine or you just felt in love in trail running uh i mean i was trail running when i was in when i was 14 or 15 years old i started running in cross country uh yeah, in high yeah. school um but in my my parents backyard was a, a state park in new jersey and so okay. on the weekends on the summers I, I just ran on the trails all the time. So I, I love that. Um, I guess after university, I started getting, did some uh, less, I wasn't running on the track anymore, but I did road racing for a running club, 5Ks, 10Ks, uh, quickly up to the marathon distance. Um, maybe for a few years, I did some more stuff on the roads while I was ultra running, but uh, I very quickly switched to, I mean, my training <laughs> continue to have plenty of time on the roads because it's easy it's out the front door a lot of times but yeah for um, the access my passion yeah the access is there but i mean i guess i started running with that virginia happy trails club in 
September or October of 2000. And that following April, I ran my first 50K. And five weeks later, I ran my first, I guess it was like 115K or 100K. 110, 115K, yeah. And just kind of fell in love with that. Um, what's not love? What's not to love about ultra running? It's doing, as some people would say, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. And uh, ultra yeah. running fits into that category. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I'm curious, what was your first road marathon? <laughs> One that nobody has ever heard of. It was called <laughs> uh, The Last train to boston um okay. and it was literally the last weekend you could qualify for the boston marathon i didn't tell anyone except my roommate that i was running a marathon i'd never run probably more than like 20 or 21 miles and i just decided i wanted to run boston that year so i ran i finished second i think to michael wardy in that race of all things wow. but i went out uh i went out and it was just I went to the Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland, rented, I didn't have a car. I had to get a credit card so I could rent the car to go to the marathon. Wow. <laughs> and uh, yeah, finished it and got a Boston qualifier. So then whatever, six or eight weeks later, I ran Boston uh, okay. as my second marathon. Okay. And after that, the trail was the, your new marathon. <laughs> yeah. So I guess it must've been 2001 and then, Uh, just a, yeah, less, less, basically a year later after my first marathon, I ran my first ultra, not to prove anything. It was just the people I was running with, uh, yeah. were ultra marathoners. And I was still, I stayed in the Washington DC area from 2000 to 2009. And that whole time I would on Sunday morning, meet up with my road running club and we would go running on the, the canal bike path or whatever. Um, and would still occasionally jump in a road marathon, but Um, it was no longer my focus. Yeah, like cross-training road marathon. <laughs> yeah, my fastest marathon ever was quite literally uh, a training run for Western States 100. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool on the resume. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, nice. So, um. Yeah, and it's like for me too, because when you're focused on the road, you don't know that you'll trust uh, exists. But when you go with a group of guys that run 50K, you're, oh, you're like more open mind on that. You're, oh, 100 mile. So did the, did you heard about 100 mile distance and did it was something that you want to do? Yeah, I mean, I think probably even in that first run, I, the the people I ran with that day had all done 100 mile runs. Uh, they had run Western States for decades. So wow, I kind of got very great. quickly and, and they, the club they were in put on a 100 mile or outside of where we lived. So I very quickly heard about them, but I was very careful. So I ran that 50 kilometer race in say April in early June, I ran my uh, 70 mile race. So 100 and 10, 115 kilometers. Um, but I, at that point I said, no, like they were all like, Oh, so you're running a hundred mile next. I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah. I, I could, but I want to get better at the shorter distances. I want to experience them and enjoy them first before I ruin the surprise of a new distance. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. you can go from a marathon to a, a hundred mile or a marathon to a 50 mile to a hundred mile or in a short span of time and be fine but i just for enjoyment like why not savor each experience and try a 50k and get better at them and try 50 mile races and get better at them and then try 100 miles i mean no no criticism to people who make the the leap really quickly but i guess i chose to very intentionally wait a couple years to run 100 miles no but knowing I, i wanted to sometime yeah Yeah, but sounds like a more reasonable plan to progress the distance, to be more comfortable with recuperation, no injury. And yeah, and to keep learning. I mean, there's so many, I mean, I think there's, with ultra marathons in particular, there's so much to learn about just not making mistakes or if you make a mistake, recovering from them. Like 
yeah, training is important and your mindset is important, but things go wrong during mm-hmm. ultra marathons. And especially as you get to a hundred miles or longer, like of it's course. about, it's just as much about logistics and not just having your gear there, but it, it, uh, the solving the problems and overcoming them and yeah. Or preventing them in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I hear you. Uh, so how did the Iron Far experience arrive in your life? Did it was something that you have in your head that you want to start or? I mean, I guess it comes from two different things. I, uh, only a couple years after college, I went to law school and I was also working full time. So I started a blog, not about running, just a blog about my life because I knew I wouldn't have time to, uh, for my friends and family, not, this was not to be like a, a public person or anything, but I knew I wouldn't have time to write or phone all of my friends and family all the time. So mm-hmm. I had a blog and then toward the end of law school, maybe after it, just after it, I was like, I, I'm writing about running a lot and I don't want to bore my friends, <laughs> my, <laughs> my normal friends. So yeah, I was like, ah, let me just spin off a, a, a running blog. Just a, like people do that with Facebook now, like write about their races or their training or ask questions about products. And at that time, Facebook wasn't as big a thing as it is today or social media in general. So yeah, the course. blog was a platform to, there were tens of thousands of running blogs and I was just another one of those. Um, but at the same time, I remember... July 2006, I was taking the bar exam, kind of like our qualification exam to become an attorney. And studying all summer long, I took off from my job. Uh, but at the same time, I, I bought the domain irunfar.com and started programming. Not that I thought I'd have a blog, but there weren't really good databases on races in terms of date and distances and vertical and that sort of thing. So I kind of had in my mind creating something in the sport, like providing a service, um, providing information. And I didn't, I bought the domain and I learned a little bit about the web, the sort of the web world at that point, but uh, it wasn't for another year or so that I decided to, to do anything with it. Okay. Okay. And did did your family and your friends continue to follow you on your running blog too? I think they did. <laughs> Not as many because I keep for a couple, maybe a year, I kept the old blog going. Uh, okay. But some friends and family did uh, for sure. Okay, of course. That's nice. And now, what, how did the books arrive? Like, it's, I, I just want to make it clear like in Bromont, in Quebec, there's a lot of place here that's one of the Bible for ultra running. And a lot of people are using it. So the book is called Relentless Forward Progress, and it's incredible. So it's an, It was a complete accident. I never oh. thought I'd write a book. I never tried to write a book. Um, I guess in May of 2009, I quit my job as an attorney in Washington, D.C. and moved out to California. Um, and that summer... I went on the road for three months, just going to races, going around to see friends or like friends in the running world. And I went to a trade show, the outdoor retail show in Salt Lake City and went out to a dinner with Matt Hart and Eric Grossman, two ultra runners. And somehow during that dinner, Eric was asking, so you're a writer now. I've got this book that I'm supposed to write, but I just don't have He's a professor. He didn't have time to write it. And I guess he asked at that point, like, did, did I have interest in writing it? And I think he was already the second person who had, like, the contract had been passed on for this book. Somebody pitched it and got a contract. It went to Eric at some point, And I got it as a third person in line. <laughs> um, and I was like, I guess, sure, why not? I guess I can write a book. And I started writing it a little bit that autumn didn't make much progress kind of started having a deadline i think my deadline was the end of february and i'd written maybe 20 percent of the book and then february i I mean i was still running i run far which at that time was overwhelming to for me to take care of 
But February, I was just like, I'm locking myself in my bedroom. I mean, not my bedroom, my office. And in a month, I basically wrote the book. I'd been thinking yeah. about it for months. And I, it's funny because M- Megan, my wife, has edited my column on I Run Far for years. And she's always like, hey, Brian, you're going to write your column. It's Sunday afternoon. and I need it by the end of the day, Monday. And I just sit down and 60 or 90 minutes later, I have – a thousand words, 1500 words, not because it's, I'm just writing on the spot, but if I'm writing on a topic, I've been thinking about it on my runs. I've been thinking about it. Maybe not when I'm falling asleep, but during the day or whatever, I, I do a lot of my building of my writing just in the background. So I've been thinking about creating the book relentless forward progress in my head and when it finally came time for a deadline, it was actually surprisingly easy to write two or 3,000 words in a day on a topic because I knew what I wanted to say. Yeah. So did, do you think you're a better writer on pressure? Or did the pressure, um, time pressure was a... Uh, I think so. I think, I think it's important for me... It, time pressure gives me a way to get the thoughts out ideally yeah. like with this book like i mean i edited it like there was a multiple drafts after like during that month i mean i probably wrote i don't even want to know how fast i wrote the actual first draft maybe it was that whole month i don't recall but then there's i actually like the editing process which i do honestly less of when i'm writing a, a my monthly column for i run far because it's just kind of my thoughts of the moment Whereas if I'm writing a book like Relentless Forward Progress, there was a lot of a lot of revisions. So maybe that's the difference. Yeah, I like the time pressure to make a first draft of something. And the final draft of my I Run Far article for my column is pretty close to it. Whereas a book, I do evolve and improve. Okay, so... Do you think that your column in I Run Far helped you to be a better writer? In a way, or maybe it confirms, I don't know if it makes me a better writer, but it conf- it confirms my style or the way I like to write. Yeah. Because I I mean, I could write like a lawyer, I could write like an academic. I prefer to have a conversational tone in my writing. And so having the column, which is very informal, I think helps me with that. And then sometimes I get, I fight back against uh, Megan or Sarah who edit me. Uh, being like, no, 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 I want this to be uh, not misspellings and typos and, and missing words, but the style of the voice to be as if you and I were talking on a run. Yeah, of course. And, uh, it's very, it's what I like of your book. It's not based on science. It's not, it's, yes, you do have a little, but it's more practical. And it's what I like about it because it's, it's like uh, no matter what your what is your goal in ultra running, this book will help you. So I think it's very practical, and it's why I refer it as my Bible of trail running. <laughs> yeah, I mean the, the book itself is. I mean in that same vein, that same idea of. I was very lucky. If I if I I mean I can envision being on those runs with the Virginia Happy Trails runners in 2001 and 2002 2003 2004 and us literally being on the trail and like asking them all right questions about hydration during an ultra marathons or questions about fueling or this kind of equipment and it wasn't citing this bit of science or that bit of science and they would disagree and have conversations about it and sometimes the various perspectives help me arrive at my own conclusion Um, but I really enjoyed that mentorship style and that familiar casual style of learning about ultra marathons. And I think it's, you can find success with that. I mean, I, I I have thought for a couple years and again, this year, one of these years, I'm going to write a second edition of relentless forward progress. I don't think a ton will change. There's a couple factual things I want to change. Yes. There's a couple things that I would pre- present a little bit more information on because people have asked questions afterward. 
and I'd update some of the people who maybe gave uh, not quotes, but who added sections because they might not be known these days. But if I were to change anything, not change, I think the biggest change would be maybe tips or tricks kind of on the mental side. Cause I think I wasn't as aware of it or as conscious of it at the time, but the mental aspect of racing ultra marathons and the mental aspect of training for ultras is just so important. Like yesterday I ran 55 kilometers. Uh, Oh, maybe with, I I'd have to look back at the vertical, but 2,500 meters of vertical, something like that at high elevation. And I bribed myself. I said, I'm going to go fish along the way. And I did. And Mm -hmm. it was, it was, it was super, it was not super cold, but it was minus five Celsius at the start, maybe one Celsius at the end. The rivers were all frozen over more or less, but still the idea of fishing a couple times along my run made me go out there in the middle of November in the high mountains of Colorado and get a long run in. And, and it could be something else for other people. The point is not what I bribed myself with, but it was a, I tricked myself or not, not tricked myself. I gave encouragement for myself to go out there and do something that's physically hard. And if I don't have a, uh, a motivator is is really mentally challenging, but I yeah, made it really sure. easy. I'm gonna, yeah, I want to go fish this place that's 25 kilometers from here. Well, I better go run there. <laughs> yeah, yes, you mix the two of those. So did you run this uh, in Soto? Hmm. You make oh, yes, okay. alone. Yeah. See, yeah. it's a, it's a long run in so yeah. so um I think you probably answered a question, but Audrey, the trail running founder of my club in Brahma, I have a question for you. Is if you were to republish this book, what <laughs> you what you have changed? What would you change on it? So you think yeah, again, there's a couple a couple scientific points, and part of it was maybe. I don't know, sloppiness. Part of it is changing dynamics. Like I talk about uh, acetaminophen as a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. It's not, it's a pain dilution drug. So I changed the fact there Uh, a little bit on the hydration salt front has changed um, both in science and in my own experience since then. So I'd update that. I'd update some of the, some of the people who are resources in the book I I mean, I was an unknown author, third person on the contract for this book. Maybe mm-hmm. this time I'd have a little more leverage to, or maybe things have just changed where I could point to the other books in the space and maybe all the, everything's black and white. Maybe I could get some just better. I mean, I, I've taken a lot of good photos than for them. I have people who have like I, maybe aesthetically updating the book, but, uh, and again, that mental aspect just tips for making it more fun and and not just the training but i ran hard rock this year in it's my fourth hard rock but it was by far i was going into my worst fitness like i was transitioning from being the editor and chief of i run far to not being i I just a lot on my plate with my life in the spring so i was an okay fitness so i went out there and told myself i'm gonna have as much fun as I can have as long as I can have it. And I fished during the race. I tried to, uh, tried, I tried to have as much fun with my other, I can't, my fellow entrants. I don't want to call them competitors because hard rock, you don't compete. You are all in it together, but just Mm -hmm. trying to have fun with them. Every single person I encountered who has having a hard time, I stopped and tried to help physically, mentally, and just, that made for such a more enjoyable race race. I put that in quotes, but yeah. or a, a, more, a more enjoyable event and experience than if I was trying to get every bit of performance out of myself. And in the end, while it was my slowest hard rock, I think I 
actually performed my best for my fitness of any time I've run hard rock. If that makes any sense. Like yeah. I was way less fit, but I had a really fun and strong first day. I struggled a little bit during the night and then I actually felt better the second day, which was, I, it was very challenging. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, um, I, I, it was really cool to experience in a, in a hard hundred mile race to, to go from a, a good first day to a hard night and then actually feeling good again, relatively speaking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course. It's, it's one of the hardest hundred mile in the world. So yeah, I hear you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, um, did did your approach of mindset evolve in the 20 years you're in the ultra running scene? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I I when I started ultra running, it wasn't that far after being a a competitive athlete in in high school and college. Like I I was competitive and even in road running shortly thereafter. And I think that I brought that into ultra marathons. And I don't, it would be interesting for me to try to think of when that changed. I mean, maybe that's, I guess I can kind of think of when it changed. And I think the COVID break. Yeah. Uh, not in some relevatory way, but I, I was going from, you know, before my forties into my forties kind of during that break. And you get older, you get a little, like not everyone, but chances are, if you've been a runner for a long time, as you get into your forties and mid forties, you're getting a little slower. Um, and not, not just for competition. because I guess you could look at your age group and that sort of thing, which is, something that doesn't really motivate me a whole lot at this point, maybe if I'm 90, <laughs> it'll motivate me. But like, uh, yeah, just the break from racing um, changed things. Even before that, I was supposed to run a, a, a 250 mile race, a 400 kilometer race in China. I think it must've been in August, 2019. Maybe I'm misremembering that, but it got, canceled the foreigners right before the race. So I kind of just had a break from racing from, I feel like 2018 into 2021. And it just changed things for me. Um, I, I haven't, I never wrote the article and I don't know if I ever will because I, I think people would take it the wrong way. Maybe it would be too controversial, but I, I used to love running races, not just to be competitive. I could run a race for a training run, like run a sign up for an 80 K to, to, to run it just as a supported long run. But for me, the equation doesn't work anymore. Like races are expensive and I don't have a problem with race organizations or race directors covering their expenses, giving to charity, whatever it is. But for me, it's hard for me to pay us $225 to run 80 kilometers. Yeah. When I literally two weeks ago, I went out and ran 80 kilometers here in the San Juan mountains of Colorado by myself. Mm -hmm. I, I, and maybe that's another change is just if you've been ultra running for a long time or, you're just an adventurer. You can just go out and do long runs by yourself and really enjoy those. Like I, that run, that 80 kilometer run, I had to go over a pass that was snow covered and had a bunch of tout, like it was a trail, but kind of a rough trail. And I had to go over that. It's almost like almost 4,000 meters and it's almost winter time and like that's mentally challenging and then i didn't want to go back over that at night which i was going to have to do so i on the fly totally changed my route and went over a pass where i didn't know what the conditions were like but i thought might be better and so i guess my point there is just like the relationship with racing has changed 
and that maybe I don't need it as much. Maybe part of that is the value, like literally money to experience. Um, and part of that is just being able to have my own adventures and have those be completely fulfilling. Even if it's just me going out for a really long run and enjoying it. And, but I will change, I will add one caveat to that. And that I still really love a very challenging, every race is challenging. I say the hardest race I've ever done is 800 meters on the track. Oh yeah. It is just, it, it hurts from very soon into it to the end. It's intense. It's horrible, but uh, having a, by challenging race, I mean, something that I don't know if I will finish a hard rock 100. If I were to be able to run the, the 400 kilometer race in China again, uh, I, I ended this summer in very bad shape because I took a break and went to Alaska for two months to have fun and not concentrate on running and having the, I'm going to run the wild uh, new race in New Zealand, a race called they have the fee 5,000, which is 85 kilometers, 5,000 meters of climbing. And to get ready for that in three months was a big challenge. And not even three months, two months. I take that back, two months. Uh, <laughs> but they, so to, to have a race, put a race on my calendar that really challenges me to get in better shape uh, to be able to finish, I still like that kind of race. Uh, so anytime I'm in hard rock, there's that challenge. There's, there's other races out there that would be the same sort of challenge, but I use that as an example. Um, Okay, yeah. but there's one thing I hear on what you said, but you don't said it clearly. It seems like your approach, your race day, like more fun than before. Seems like before was like more a little competitive, and now seems you're like more in the present moment. You enjoy fly fishing or whatever what happens. Like you're more. I don't see connected in the moment and more, more, yeah, more fun. I think it is more fun. I mean, I, there, there's, there are benefits to both approaches. Like I don't regret trying to raise hard, especially yeah. when I was younger and, and yeah, giving it my best and trying to get my ideal performance. But I still think I now think at 45 years old, I can perform at nearly as well as I possibly could by trying to have fun. Cause yeah, you, yeah. I mean, it's a cliche, but if you're smiling, you're like, it doesn't hurt as much. And if you're having more, like, I don't know if you've had this experience, but if you're running a, a race, especially an ultra marathon, if you can run with other people for part of it, it could be a really good friend, but it could be a stranger you've ne never talked to before and you're talking to them and you're the miles, the kilometers, the hours, they go by so much quicker and with not just quicker, but with less effort. Of course. So if you yeah. have a, if you have a hundred mile race or a hundred kilometer race, if you can, if you can spend 50 kilometers at a hundred K race, or if you can do 120 kilometers of that hundred mile race where you're mostly with other people and you're talking and you're encouraging one another and you're checking in on each other Well, wow, that those are all those kilometers go by and you're not having to work mentally. Yeah. You're just out there having fun. And maybe the race spreads out later. It's not you're trying to be ahead of someone else or you're they're trying to be ahead of you, but things spread out late in a race and you might not want to be 30% slower or faster to stay with somebody else. Yeah. Um so things split up, but you've had maybe two thirds of your race where you You were just mentally cruising. You weren't even thinking about it. I mean, you were paying attention to eating and drinking and that sort of thing, but you're not, all right, I've got to keep going. I'm doing that. Like, yeah, no, there's no you, struggling thing. No struggle. No, you yeah. now you've got 50 kilometers of a hundred mile race to to run on working hard and 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 struggling because you're going to. Um yeah. But that's a lot better than struggling for 160 kilometers or <laughs> 120 kilometers. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think it's – and it's just – again, it's it's also more fun in the moment. Uh, I mean, 
I guess I've always done it. I've now, yeah, I've run hard rock four times and I take five to 700 photos during hard rock because <laughs> I, I enjoy it. And I like sharing the photos afterward. And maybe I'd be, maybe I could be faster by not doing that, but maybe I wouldn't be. Maybe that enjoyment along the way makes me happier and yeah, makes me of course. better. <laughs> yeah. And there's something in the community of trail running that I didn't see in a lot of sport is there's the, like people are very, um, very friendly when we are in competition. It's like we made new friend along the way and it's like the community is so strong. 100%. And again, I hate to keep using the same example, but at Hard Rock, like in 2015, 16, and 2018, I was trying to run as I was in really good fitness for myself. I was trying to run my best race. No, I was all like every time late in the race where if I would pass or be passed by Tim Olson or Scott Jaime, or whoever else it was. And it wasn't just me, it was both sides. They're all like, and it's so honest and so real, was encouraging the other person. Whoever was faster, whoever was slower, it didn't matter. And we kept going back and forth. It, it changed all the time. But every time it happened, you were just, you wanted that other person to have their best day, sincerely, as they wanted you to. And that's, that's such a cool aspect. And I like having reported on these races for so long, I've seen people complain of when people at the front of Lake Sonoma 50 mile or an, another race hold hands and come across a line together. But that's not that sincere admiration of the other person, that sincere, sincere thanks. Those people don't owe anything to somebody watching the race on, on Twitter or a live stream. Like if they're getting a little bit of money, it's not very much for the most part. And if that's what's meaningful to them, if they've run 60 kilometers of an 80 kilometer race together, if they've run the last 70 kilometers of a hundred mile race together, who are we to say that's not right for them to finish together? That's ridiculous. Like of course. that's what I'm going to do. If I've been running with somebody in a long ultra marathon and why can't somebody at the very front of the pack or the very back of the pack do the same thing? Like th those races are hard for everyone. <laughs> yeah, of course. No matter what is the ultra distance, ultra distance is always hard. Yes. <laughs> And yes, uh, I'm on the same page of you on everything you said about that. And I think, um, okay, we don't talk about the top five, but if you are not on the top five, what is the point to competition for nothing when you finish? You have a medal in, in a, <laughs> and food and there's, there's no prize. There's no... so. I think the best experience is finished with smile because you will remind us better. Yeah. And but. I mean, the, and I under, I, at the same time, I understand completely wanting to do your own personal best. Like, you know what I mean with a time, but of like course. getting yeah. the best out of you on that day. If that's your motivation that day, great. I, yeah. like, I've tried it many, 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 many times at ultra marathons. Like, trying to do my best for who I am and my fitness that day. And it could be yeah. last year or the earlier this year with poor fitness going into hard rock. Maybe I was a little less oriented that way, but plenty of other times. It, yeah. I'm trying to do my best, especially at that race where I might focus on for half a year. Yeah. But it, it's not at the expense of someone else. It's not to beat them. It's about, over that whole 100% of that race, have I done as well as I can for me? And I hope that other person also got their 100%. And if they're ahead of me, great. If they're behind me, fine. Um, but 
I can understand trying to to do well because yeah. it's a test. And yes, it, for for many people, finishing is a big test. And for other people or those same people on other days, running a little bit stronger or feeling strong for the last 10 or 20 kilometers of a long ultra marathon, that's amazing. Like those are some of my favorite experiences in life have been the last 20, 30, 50 kilometers of a long ultra marathon feeling strong. I don't care if I was 20th or 200th. Uh, it's incredible. Like me, the human body can do that. I can do that. Yeah. So cool. Like we can amaze ourselves with, with how we, what we're able to accomplish and how we can perform. Even if that's totally separate from what other people are doing. Yeah, of course. But I do respect a lot the people that are more competitive. We, we, yeah. what is cool about trail running? We do, uh, all the people have their place. So there's no judgment and that's yeah. fine with that. So um, what was your favorite race that you have done? What was the, the race you will always remember? Wow, that's a great question because it's so hard to narrow down. Uh, <laughs> After more than 20 years too, eh? Yeah, I mean, I think at this point, I would probably have to say it was Ultra Trail Gobi race then. And now it's most recently it was called Ultra Gobi. But it was that 400 kilometer race in, in China, in Western oh, China. Okay. And it just went so well. Uh, I mean, it's hard to run 400 kilometers. I actually went into it thinking, I want to test the, you know, is a 200 mile race stupid? Is this just a horrible <laughs> concept? It's a new thing. I don't get it. I don't know if I like it. But I can't make a judgment. I can't make, not a judgment, but I can't speak to that if I don't try it. And I tried yeah. it and it was awesome because the intensity was lower. So like eating wasn't a problem because if you've run, if you race 50 kilometers, if you race 80 kilometers, and if you race 100 miles, eating can be a real challenge. Yeah. I found at 400 kilometers, the intensity was so low. <laughs> That eating was not a problem, no matter how hot, no matter how cold I could eat, which was awesome. Um, but just, it was a cool race in that it was, there was, I want to say 30 checkpoints, but between the checkpoints, you chose your course. There was a recommended route, maybe a little bit of flagging, but you could choose your own way. It was in the middle of nowhere it was in an area of the world I would never have gone to. I mean, I could go to, to Quebec. I could go to Catalonia. I could go to Patagonia. There's all these places that even if exotic are on the radar of a Western traveler. Yeah. The Western part of China is not on that radar. Like you're, you're just not going to go there to, to visit. So seeing some place that's very exotic, very different was really cool um and to be proven wrong not proven wrong but to have my maybe skepticism challenged in a good way of okay here's a new kind of ultra marathon maybe this isn't horrible for the body maybe it's kind of enjoyable i mean my feet were destroyed afterward but everything else was kind of okay uh I don't want to do it again. They, it was on hold for a couple of years with China and zero COVID, but uh, I've heard rumors it's coming back and it's real tempting. Okay. The easy answer if I were, <laughs> would be hard rock. It's so beautiful. Like I live here now uh, because it's the terrain is just so amazing. Uh, I ran hard rock this year and intentionally I hadn't run most of the course since 2018 and I hadn't run the course in this direction since 2016 or 2015, 2015, whatever, a really long time. So I just got to experience it again anew and it just, it's phenomenally beautiful Okay, <laughs> and hard. Yeah. Yeah. Of and hard. I, could, <laughs> I, I forgot how I'm glad I forgot how hard it is because I entered the lottery again for next year, uh, <laughs> but it's stupidly hard. It's so hard. So did 
now you're living in Colorado for a lot of years. Do you think it helped you to race, uh, race with high level elevation? Yes, I think so. If, it, if we're just talking about high elevation, I don't think it makes living at high altitude makes you just a generally better ultra marathon runner. Uh, I don't know if you remember the name Megan Kimmel. She was yeah. on Solomon and a very, very strong runner, say from like the sky running distances up to 80 kilometers. And she lived in Silverton for a really long time and eventually moved because training here was really hard if you were trying to do intensity. If you're trying to race fast, you just can't train fast up here. <laughs> uh, maybe Killian, maybe Jim Walmsley, when they come visit, maybe they can run fast up here. For, but for humans, it's impossible. <laughs> uh, yeah. So maybe it would make me slower at most ultra marathons living up here. Certainly for a marathon, it would. But running at high altitude is definitely easier or running or hiking in high altitude is way easier from being here and that's actually one one thing i was sad about when they canceled that last ultra gobi is they changed from the course i had run to a race course that was almost all above 3,000 meters if i remember correctly Whoa. and it went higher than that like it was it was really on the tibetan plateau uh or similar terrain maybe but I was so excited that I was just going to be able to race at high altitude when no one else. I mean, I live at 2,800 meters, like for, tri for racing at high altitude. There's not that's a an lot advantage. Of, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. And there's not a lot of trail runner on this scene that have this advantage. No, you can be like in the Andes. There's a couple places in China or there's here. Like there's yeah. just not a lot of, places where there's competitive trail runners and really high altitude that you can live at. Yeah. You can go to a training camp somewhere. People will come over to, to Silverton for a month before hard rock. If they're are able to, and really, really trying to perform, but yeah, it's, it's an advantage for trying to run at high altitude, living at high altitude. Yeah, of course. So the race of in China, 400 kilometer, how did you manage that? Uh, did, did you sleep on the race? How did you manage your <laughs> sleep experience? So I tried to have as much, again, as much fun as I could. Uh, yeah. And I, I was, I learned a lesson. My wife, Megan Hicks, had run Tour de Giant, uh yeah. a few years earlier. And she had what uh, adventure racers call the sleep monsters, meaning late in the race, like, your lack of sleep just destroys you. Um, she had wanted to, she had a plan that she was going to sleep the first night a little bit, sleep the second night, and she just couldn't sleep the first night. So she got destroyed. So my plan at Ultra Gobi was to sleep full nights of sleep, like six to eight hours of sleep. So the first night I did, the second night I did. After that, the third morning or the third, the morning of the third night, that stretched we were only allowed to sleep at the major checkpoints like tortoise calls them life bases whatever um and that section was just very the topography was very challenging so it took me until like i want to say six in the morning to get to that life base and i ate a, a quick meal and went to bed and the sun hit the tent like an hour after i went to bed and it just got hot and uncomfortable so i went and then the last night i just kept running but my intention was to, to actually get sleep. And I, the last night I didn't need to, I was like, I'm, I'm 50 kilometers from the finish and I feel I'm not sleepy and I I'm moving pretty well. Like, why am I going to now stop just because it's night? So I kept going, but it was really sleeping. Those first two nights was pretty made for a really fun experience. Now, when I planned to return there in 20, I want to say 2019, I can't remember if it was that year or 2018, but when I was going to return, I talked to a lot of adventure racers in hopes of doing performing or being much faster. So I kind of had a plan to not sleep the first night because mm -hmm. during hard rock, I don't sleep during the first night during other hundred milers. I wouldn't sleep the first night. 
So I was not going to sleep on night one. I was going to sleep 90 minutes, maybe ahead of dawn on the second night and then try to run to the finish. Uh, oh. And if I really, really had to take a short nap, but that wouldn't be the plan. Okay. So I kind of, one of the reasons I want to go back and do a, a 400 kilometer race or 300 kilometer race is to try to do it on little sleep. Cause I've done it on a lot of sleep and that was fun. But I also <laughs> having reported on so many races overnight and we're like still working 40 hours later or 42 hours later, like at a, a hard rock reporting or a UTMB reporting like, and working through law school. I've, I've worked through a night and into the like second night so many times. I kind of want to, see what racing doing that is like. Okay. So um, have you ever done 200 mile race in the US? I have not yet, no. No? Okay. Uh, with Do you think it's one of your plans in the future or you're more attracted uh, by China, I think so? Well, I mean, China is an example, but it's it's... For me, one of the remaining race reasons to race is to really go somewhere different, somewhere yeah. and really explore. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. If there was a if there was a two hundred mile race in Kazakhstan, or I'm just ma making up a a destination, or Nepal, or somewhere like to get me to travel, I could see doing that. That said, like there's the Moab two forty uh, in in Utah. And it's in an area where my wife and I have a, a cabin. I've lived in that area before. I've actually like brought gear to people who needed it during the race before. And I, I think it interests me. I could see myself running the Moab 240 someday. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I do have a other question from one friend I received before on the podcast, uh, Lee, and she asked me to ask you: Did did sometimes you miss your um, your career before running? That was a lawyer. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I I worked with good people, um, but I like to say like they there wasn't enough personal satisfaction that they could pay me enough to do it. I just, I didn't enjoy it. I was, I, I was never in a courtroom kind of situation, but I was a regulatory attorney in a big city. And I would write, I would spend a week working on a question, write a memo, give it to the higher up in my law firm that would go to the company and I would never know what happened. And I would have spent a week working on something and, I don't know the outcome. So it, it just wasn't satisfying. That said, I've never given up my, uh, my license to be a lawyer. Okay. Cause I could see, I could see someday. I don't want, again, I don't want to be a courtroom attorney ever, but I could see myself working for a nonprofit in the environmental or conservation world where having that license would be useful as a credential. Uh, and maybe my title would have to, you know, I would be some sort of lawyer for that organization, but more as a an advocate, more of a, a liaison. I don't know, like, yeah, I don't, I don't miss just being a regular attorney and I don't think I'll go back. Okay, okay. <laughs> Nice. So my friend have other question, very more funny. And she asked, did the fly fishing help you on um, time on your feet for ultra running? <laughs> uh, I think it helps me. I enjoy, like, it, it gets me out the train. I did 55 kilometers with 2,500 meters of vertical yesterday because yeah. I wanted to go fly fish. Uh, yeah. I did 80 kilometers two weeks ago fly fishing. You does fly it, fish it, in hard rock? <laughs> I did, and it was fun. Uh, so I think having run for so long, it's nice. I kind of like to describe it as for all of those years, I would try to go to the, the, the top of the mountain, or I would try to go over to the mountain pass. 
and I was always looking up. Um, and now I'm looking down more. And I, I mean, that means looking at new locations, looking at rivers and streams and lakes that I would never made a destination before. But I was always very, I was also always watching nature. I was always watching the trees and the deer and the terrestrial life. And now I'm also thinking about another area of life in the waters. So it's made me connect with a totally different area that I never would have connected with before, which I think is really cool. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, it's helped my ultra running in recent years, 100% because it gives me something fun to look forward to. Now, what I, if I was still living in Washington, DC, would I necessarily be fly fishing while I was running? No, probably not because I was running with other people. Like if I had a running group or a, a big group of friends that I was uh, on next Saturday could go for a long run with, that would change things maybe. But I, Silverton's a very small town. It's remote. There's no running club. And the places I lived before, that really wasn't an option. So having an external motivation is really useful. And maybe that's too deep for what the question was, but no, you know, I, I, if, if I could go run with people and not stop to fish and like, just whether we're having conversations or not, like that's an external motivation. I don't know if I've ever thought of it in that terms, but if I'm going to be running by myself, like I might as well go do something that's fun. And that, yeah, could be fun in, in hanging out with people. Like, I don't know if you have a running, you have a running group. Like that's super yeah. cool. Like I wish I had people to go run with more often and I don't. And that's fine. Yeah. I I do have, but I, I like by my own too. Um, it's, yeah. It's like cool. The nomad way of trail running too. Yeah. So I appreciate both to be honest. Yeah. So, um, do you have any uh, preferred brands of supplements that you use only? Do you have any preference? For supplements? Yeah. Nope. I don't take any. <laughs> no? Okay, okay. So, and do you have, um, what, what is the, your main nutrition for like, for example, ultra running distance like Hard Rock? Uh, it would be a mix. Uh, I guess there's probably three products I use the most. Uh, and, and there's comparable ones from other brands, but I used, uh, untapped maple syrup. Mm -hmm. I know there's a couple brands that now in the, in, in even in Canada, which is packets of maple syrup. I love yeah. it. It's, I, I don't actually need water with it. Like I can just, I mean, over a, a hard rock. Yes. But if I'm just on a training run, that's 30 kilometers. I can just put one or two in my pockets. And if I need it, I take it. I can take it without water. So I love it. Uh, I love the flavor. I, I'll occasionally take like a goo or another sports gel to change it up. Honey stinger. I like, uh, I love honey stinger chews. Oh I, yes. You could, yeah. You could give me a cherry blossom honey stinger chew right now. I would eat it. Like, <laughs> Yes, I love those. I like the consistency. I like the flavor. And I, I have other Honey Stinger chews as well, flavors. But I love them. I like scratch chews. Um, on the real, well, real food. I'm making air quotes here. Uh, I love peanut M&Ms. I don't eat them like on a, on a whatever night, Saturday night. I'm not just going to eat a bunch of peanut M&Ms. But I like them when I'm running. I mean, there's some sugar. There's some protein. There's some fat. Uh, I, I, I think I tried for them for the first time when I ran a hundred mile race in Alaska and it got to minus 30 Celsius. If it's that cold, your gels freeze, your chews, yeah. they freeze peanut M&Ms. They don't <laughs> freeze. It's <laughs> a good like, advice. Yeah. I mean, the bars, they freeze and you're like trying to break your teeth on them, yeah. but peanut M&Ms, they're good. Uh, I, I know I like them. Uh, so that's, and, and more so now than before I'll eat some real food during a, I don't even know what that would be. It could just be whatever's at the aid station. I like pierogi, uh, during an ultra, but whether it could be a grilled cheese sandwich and not all the time, but a little bit, of a 
longer ultras, which I now do more of, uh, a little bit of real food is great too. Okay, amazing. Yes, uh, I love uh, maple syrup too. It's like, it's easy to take it. And yeah, you can, sometimes I mix with water. If, if there's oh. nothing I could eat, I mix a little on water. So it's, it's better than nothing. It's even easier. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. of course. So um, I have big question now. I think it's going to long, long answer, but that's good. We have a lot of time. So what have you seen that have changed the most in 20 years of ultra running? I guess there's two things, the, the, the top of the competition and commercialism. Oh. On the top of the competition, uh, people have just gotten faster. I mean, yeah. and I don't know what the motivation is or what how that's happened. I mean, I think it would have been rare for somebody at 20 or 22 or 25 to have learned about ultra marathons in 20 in 2000. Like yeah. it just wasn't there. What the internet wasn't as prevalent. You would have, you just weren't hearing about those things as a normal runner or a normal person. And now you are. Yeah. So, and there's a little bit of more, not in a bad way, but there's more sponsorship money. Oh, uh, and there's more knowledge of the, of ultra marathon as a, or trail running as a pursuit. So I think you just have more people who are fast runners in, in collegiate track or, or cross country, or who may have been elite in another sport like biathlons or, or cross country skiing. Um, and I think you, they, they, they just learn about it and that not only is it something they can do for fun, they find out that it's something they can do as a, as a paid pastime or a, or as a, a full-time job. And that just wasn't a thing before. So you just have way faster people and hand in hand with commercialism. Like now for, we're now at over a decade of races, really bringing top runners to the events, even before the, this maybe salaries or compensation was as high for the runners as they are now, but you really have budgets for, I remember when sky running brought a ton of top runners to Transvolcania. I think it was, 2011 or 2012 and that really changed the game and then other races all got in a an arms race into competition and and bringing top runners which even if you're not making a full-time living like it's pretty cool to you know whether you're 20 or 30 or 40 if a race wants to fly you it's a if you're an american and you've not been to the canary islands or you've not been to switzerland like you you get to not only race there, but you get to experience the, the food and the culture and the people and the mountains or so like that's definitely changed. And there's definitely been more commercialism and that's, I don't, that's not a criticism. That's not a critical word. Uh, you, you have race series that are more commercial um, with there being more sponsorship around trail and ultra running I mean, it's just more commercial. And that's an exchange. I mean, if you have a top runner, they're, a brand might be promoting them. You might have a, you know, an Anna Frost being promoted by a Merrill or, or yeah. a Jim Walmsley by Hoka or back in the day, or let's say Francois Dane by Solomon. Like they're making videos of these people. They're using them in ad campaigns and not just as a picture or a pretty person, but telling a story. And, and that, that helps a person maybe, maybe make a living. I mean, you have tons of folks who maybe aren't racing quite as much as they used to, like a Rob Crar. He's still racing yeah. some, but he's putting on his camps and he's coaching and, and maybe that, he benefited from the North face sponsorship and that, and I'm just using him as a particular example, but like you have that happen for a lot of people where a brand pays somebody, but also invests in them and they have a longer career even beyond when they can run really fast or they get injured and they still can be a part of the sport. Um, 
but there's also pressures in, in when you have commercialism, there's ex expectations and whether that's internal or external. I mean, I remember when the first wave of a number of ultra runners say in that 2012 to 2015 range had careers, they were lawyers, they were pharmacists, they were PhD scientists and they, they quit their jobs and ran full time. And so many of them got injured or burnt out because yeah. they were already training at the top of the sport. They were literally out training mm -hmm. everybody else and they thought they needed to do more and they did more. And mm -hmm. whether that's more racing or that's more training and it doesn't work out for very long. It could work out really well for a year or two. Yeah, but, but it's, it's a uh, damage on your body. It's, it's like sometimes, uh, yeah, yeah. It's damage that can recover. Some people recover faster, but yeah, yeah it's, that's uh, that's could be dangerous, but a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with commercialism, I mean, I think it's not because of commercialism. There's definitely been a style of race. Uh, the really big trail ultra marathon has grown tremendously in the last decade. Oh, I mean, I'm yeah. not, I'm not, that's not a hint at UTMB. That's whether Ultra Trail Huracana or Quebec Mega Trail, or I mean, there's, you know, trail festivals in the United States and, and yeah. China and Thailand and France and Switzerland, wherever. And, and I say that not just for the number of runners, but the style of having dramatic music for an hour before the race and dramatic out music for the entire finish and announcers at the finish line and, and you know, whether it's live streaming or slickly produced videos of the race and all of those sorts of things is a style that wasn't around in 2000. It wasn't really a style that was around in 2010 for the most part, at least not yeah. on a global level. Um, I mean, I came into the sport in 2002 when even if a race director might have had four races, David Horton in Virginia probably did have four races, but it was each one of them was at most 300 people. And there was a, 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 a vinyl banner above the finish line that was for that race. I'll give you that. But like it was a banner that was unrolled and then rolled up at the end of the day and put back in the, the box. And there was no finish line announcer. Maybe they had a CD playing. Maybe they didn't. I don't even know. Probably not. And it was just, it. that was all, almost all of the races in the world at that time, at least the ones I was exposed to. And now there's a lot of big races with production companies, whether that's, yeah, and all the aspects with S expos and, you know, seven different races at the event. And that's not, that's just a new style of race. And I don't want to say that that's a bad development because that's motivated a ton of new people to get into the sport and gave them motivation to train and to start at the 20 kilometer race at that festival and then go to the 40 kilometer and then the hundred and then the 160. It's cool. Uh, and at the same time, the grassroots race is still here. People yeah. ask about that. I, I, a person who's directs a couple really small races asked me a, a few weeks ago, are grassroots ultramarathons dead? Should I just give up? And I was like, no. So many of us, like maybe every once in a while we go to those big slick produced races with the music and all of the, all of that, the performance before the start. But I I still want to go to mostly races that have 50 people or maybe 500 people to start. It's small. If I want to go talk to the race director the day before the race, I can. Not as Brian Powell if I run far, but as a participant. If I yeah, want to yeah, yeah. ask him a question, her or her a question on Facebook a few weeks before the race, I can. Um, at the finish line, maybe there's a barbecue, maybe there's not but people are going to be hanging out and just having a good time. And those races still exist. They will not die. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. cool. I mean, it's cool to have the option of doing both. Yeah, yes. If you want to go see Taylor Swift at a big stadium with all the lights and fireworks and whatever, awesome. You can also then go to the the little folk singer at your coffee shop on, on Thursday night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're both fun. They're both fun. And you might yes. like one, you might like to do one more than the other, but they can both exist. Okay. So just for you as a runner, do you have a preference of the two side or if you have to decide on one? But I, if I had to choose one, it would be the grassroots race for sure. Okay. Uh, I like the small, intimate feel, the going into some small gymnasium to pick up your bib the night before. Yeah. Not having a gear requirement. Yeah. Whether it's a bunch of pizza or barbecue or you bring in your own food to hang out at the finish line from three in the afternoon till 10 at night while everybody else is finishing and clapping. And like, it's not 10,000 fans clapping for you from the, from around the towns. It's the other competitors. Uh, I enjoy that. People always like I've covering the end of hard rock. I remember I had seen so many comments of like, it's such a shame. There's only 20 people at the finish line of hard rock when whoever finishes top three finisher finishes. And I'm like, no, that person who finished, they knew exactly what they were signed up for. They mm -hmm. didn't want the 10,000 people and, Lavaredo or Chamonix or or the track at Auburn in California, yeah, the Western states. They they want the small. Um, I mean, I I I don't want to speak for any of them, but how cool is it for the elite runner who's done all of those races and had a big microphone in their face at the finish with a big jumbo TV and broadcast around the world where. At the end of Hard Rock, you finish, you kiss the rock, somebody brings you a chair or you sit on the ground and you, you're not interviewed in the sense of, of media. It's just you're sitting with 20 other ultra runners at the finish line talking about what you just did. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a, it is a very intimate experience. Yes, I hear you so bad on this point. Um, I'm still... I started ultra running like eight years ago, and I think I prefer the grassroots side, but that's kind of cool. That's more people introduced to running and to yeah. being more active way. So that both of the two sides uh, are cool. So do you think the social media have a responsibility on the more popular of the sport? I would say so, but I think it's an evolution. Um, yeah, it's yeah. social media today, but 12 years ago it would have been Dean Carnazzi's Ultra Marathon Man. It would have been published books. Mm -hmm. It would have been magazine articles. It would have been some blogs. Yeah. Now it's social media and video, whether that's like live video or, or just well-produced uh, videos you can watch anytime. Like that's what it is right now. We don't know what we'll be promoting the sport in 10 years. It's it's the, the growth of the sport comes from whatever is able to share the sport at that time. It was way slower when ultra marathon ultra running magazine was publishing results from an April race in June <laughs> and they published every single finisher. And like, that's not a criticism. It's just like, the cycle has sped up and the reach has sped up. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's sexier to watch for somebody potentially joining ultra marathon to see a, a really cool video of, of Courtney to Walter or Francois Dane or whoever it is. Uh, it's really well done with great cinematography than reading their name in a black and white magazine. Like, so, I mean, I think it, but it's just changed. I mean, the, the sport was on a growth trajectory before the real rise of social media. It was books. It was blogs. Now it's Instagram and Facebook and, and YouTube. But that's not what it's going to be in 10 years. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And the evolution is 
way faster than before too. So yeah, so um, I'm curious, do you have any favorite runner or icon or <laughs> idol that you add when you start running or? I don't think when I started running, I mean, not on the famous side. I mean, I've got, I have to say Scotty Mills. He's a, he's a guy who ran Western States in the early eighties. He was on my first run with the Virginia happy trails running club. I think he was already in his late mid to late fifties at the time, but took me under his wing and showed me how to ultra run. It was more that than, than celebrities. I mean, his, his goal for his ultra running career was always focused on trying to break 20 hours at, at Western States. He never did it. He came close. But I remember one of the early times I ran Western States, he wasn't in that year, and I was. And I came into Michigan Bluff on pace to run sub-20, and he was there. I remember, like, telling him, Scotty, we're going to break 20 hours today. And, and I did. And it was truly – we. he wasn't in the race, but we broke 20 hours because – one of the cool things about and many pursuits, but ultra running is you can stand on the shoulders of giants. And Scotty Mills was, was a giant in my corner and taught me, mentored me through the sport. And he carried me, he, he was with me that day and we've run hard Western States, 70 miles of it together. And like, that was the coolest experience. Now if we're talking about celebrities, you know, people at the very front of the end, there are so many cool people in the sport. Like uh, there's people I want to go have a beer with. There's people I want to like go farm with. There's people I want to go fish with at the front of the sport. I mean uh, the conversations and people I've gotten to know. And that's the cool thing is like, whether you like ultra running, I mean, I guess there's characters throughout life, but ultra running attracts people who are characters interesting people people with different life stories people who are who aren't the norm and that's just really cool to be a part of i mean i mean are there people who just stand out i mean like you could just name anybody at the front of the sport like you know you could see a video of killian jornet and like you know is that real is like is this guy really that good at running and alpinism and everything else and yet that humble and the answer is yes like that's the kind of people the sport attracts and like you can't help if you if you've met and know those people like the same with Courtney DeWalter or Francois or or Dylan Bowman or Anna Frost or whoever you want to name like these are just good people like and that's such a cool like I mean yeah you could just throw out names and chances are I've enjoyed being around them yeah yeah okay nice that's very nice that you named one of your mentor that's uh yeah that's cool so um i do have other question for you well uh, so what what do you think about the new utmb series with iron man affiliation um what do you think about the new situation in the last three, four years now, I think? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I I could have written an article in 2014 or 15 when Ultra Trail de Mont Blanc changed the name to UTMB. Like mm -hmm. the path in my mind was clear that they were going to become a brand like Xterra Trail Runs or or other, other, it was going to become a brand and they were going to franchise or whatever the model was, but there was going to be more UTMBs. It wasn't going to just going to be Mont Blanc. And that's true. And like, as soon as Iron Man started getting involved and they were involved pretty early. I mean, I don't know exactly what year, but they bought, there was the Ultra Trail World Tour, which was a pretty cool tour. I actually really liked when it formed and it was pretty small and had a lot of really great races around the world. It was led by UTMB, not in a domineering way, but like that was the pinnacle race, like fair enough. Yeah. Um, but then Tara Weir and ultra trail Australia got bought by Ironman. I'm, 
and the writing was on the wall. I mean, there was going to be a UTMB series of some sort. Looking at the Iron Man model, there was going to be some sort of, uh, f- there was already more, many more people that wanted to run UTMB than there were entries. So there were, at some point, there was going to be a UTMB style, I mean, excuse me, an Iron Man style qualification system. The details we didn't know, but it was pretty foreseeable. Um, so I guess like none of it surprises me. Some of the details like weren't sure what would they would be, but they all kind of make sense. I don't, I can't imagine. Like you can't blame. It's a model that's been done before. So it's not surprising. It's not shocking. I guess I haven't quite figured out how I feel about just the branding of by UTMB. Like there's a bunch of really great races that are by UTMB that were great races before they were by UTMB. Like I still want to go run Lavaredo. Mm-hmm. I, I know the founders. I've been to the area. It looks amazing. I would love to go run Lavaredo. Um but what does by UTMB change of that other than making it a part of the system for qualifications and points and stones and, and all of that, which don't mean anything to me personally. Like some people are motivated to run UTMB. Well, those are the things you have to do. If you need to run Western States or your hard rock, you don't have to collect so many stones, but you still have to run certain races and finish them in a certain time. And it's it's a little more convoluted or it's it's brand associated but it's the same it's it's a similar thing i don't i haven't quite figured out the races founded by utmb if that makes any sense it just mm-hmm. what i i guess this is a question i've had going back a decade if you have if you're a race organization that has three more than like, I don't know what number four or five races, can those races have their own character? Can they be unique? Can they have a feeling that's particular to them? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. So maybe that's the draw of having a, I'm trying to think one of the new, um, by UTMB races. I'd have to look them up, but you know, maybe you're looking for essentially not that unique experience other than the landscape. Maybe you're looking for what McDonald's or Starbucks or some other big global franchise offers and that you have a, it might not be the, that particular burger or coffee or race, you know it's going to be at least this good. You know about what to expect. You know, you know your coffee is going to be about like this quality and the right temperature and you're going to have, it's going to be in a good cup and you're going to get it pretty quickly if you go to Starbucks. And maybe that's what people are looking for with a whatever, whatever by UTMB and that you know what the sign-up process is going to be. You know what the check-in process is going to be. You know you're going to have enough water at the checkpoints and, and there's going to be certain kinds of food and you're going to get this kind of metal. And I mean, maybe that's what some people are looking for. Like just a guaranteed basic quality of races. And maybe that's what by UTMB offers in their new self created events. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. That's uh, that's the that's very nice what you you talk about this. So, um, Brian, what is your personal future plan? You talk about the race in New Zealand soon. Do you yeah. have other future plans? <laughs> It's funny. I like I I I question whether I have a value in still doing races, and I figured out I do. I like to travel to explore, to be challenged, to meet new people. 
So I, I, I want to do more races. I don't, I kind of had been dreaming a little bit of a, a European spring into summer one of these years. Uh, I really enjoyed being in Austria this spring for the, the Trail World Championships. So I've thought about going to Innsbruck or a Stubaital uh, area and running one of the races there in the spring and then going to Lavaredo. And then in Basque country, there's a, a, a bunch of races uh, under the Ehunmalak name. And that Ehunmalak is their hunter miler. And it, it looks really grassroots and really rugged and really challenging. And I've loved visiting Basque country for Zagama marathon before. So I don't know. Well, I, I dream of doing that as a, as a dis single like season someday. Uh, I dream of going to the Lake District of England, uh, which are famous for the fell racing. And a lot of those are shorter distance races, but they have some ultras as well. I did a couple when Megan uh, went to do the Bob Graham round a few years ago, but I'd love to prepare and just go race short off trail races for two or three months sometime just get an apartment and a uh i don't know if i have to, have to buy a car and sell it back but just figure out a cheap way to go over to the lake district and live for for a season um around the world i don't know if there are races i want to go run a mongolia someday i want to go back to western china i want to go back to nepal I'd love to go back to do Bhutan. So the, the very high lands of Asia are just spectacular. You're you're looking around at four thousand meter peaks, and they don't have names because it's just four thousand meters. Like why 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 would it have a name? There's everything else is taller, so it's just kind of cool over there. Um, but I don't know what my plans are for next year. Uh, as as with so many people, my name is in a lottery. Uh, I'm in hard yeah. rock. If I get in, I get in, uh, and I run it. If I don't, uh, I find something else. Maybe it's going to spend that season in Europe. Maybe it's not. If it's not, uh, I have a crazy fishing adventure. I yeah. want to run a hundred miles and catch 10 species of fish, which wow. I don't think I'm pretty sure no one has ever done. Uh, <laughs> so I kind of have that in my mind with a friend. Like a new FTG. So it could be <laughs> what? Like a new kind of F F F T T F K T. <laughs> yes, yes, very much so. So I don't know. The, the the I have lots of things that still interest me. Part of that just depends on how lotteries work out different years. Um, but it's a mix of races. It's a mix of adventures. It's a, a mix of races as a reason to go travel somewhere um so yeah cool i'm not done ultra running yet let's put it that way <laughs> <laughs> and at the moment in 2023 november what are you the most proud of your career and everything you have done in the running scene um I would, it's, I don't know, I can think of a couple things, but I, for better and worse, I was you very intentional. Have, you can have more than one answer too. Well, I mean, I think if I had to pick one, for better and worse, uh, going back a long way, I really wanted to help foster in a sense of an international trail running and ultra running community. When I started doing I run far, you know, maybe there was, I, there was maybe North American ultra running because some folks from Canada would come run a race here and, and vice versa. There was Europe was kind of integrated. Like there was, there was a, already the sky running world series. Maybe there's the La Sportiva series over there. There were a couple races in Asia, but they're really, it's funny. I remember talking to, I think somebody, some person in marketing at Solomon in like 2009. And they were like, do you think Killian can make it as a celebrity in the United States? 
because they'd previously Europe, some European brands had tried to bring some European runners to the U S and see if they become known and it didn't, it never worked. And I think kind of the same in the other direction. Um, and I just, I guess I've always felt that if you can see, if you can look up to people from other places, if you can see them as people, if you can admire them, the world's a better place. Like we're connected. I, I don't know if like that's a, <laughs> overarching to say brings about world peace. That's probably too lofty a goal, but to, to understand and feel a connection with people around the world, I think is super special. I've seen it grow people in all over the world become fans of runners from other places. I've seen the top runners from around the world become friends. Uh, I've seen normal runners from around the world become friends. And to the smallest degree, I hope I run far has been a part of that. Like we've always, we have had people complain to us from the United States that why aren't you cut, you know, why aren't you interviewing just like three Americans before UTMP? Because we wanted to interview the, the top competitors going into that race or the same with after the race, we weren't just going to interview the American competitors knowing very well that we would have a lot less traffic for the unknown French woman who finished second at UTMB than we would about the famous American runner who dropped out or finished 13th. And that was very deliberate. It wasn't about traffic. It was about, we're going to try to, be very egalitarian in covering the world and, and hope that's good. Okay. Nice. But thanks a lot for your, all the collaboration, all the effort, uh, all, all you bring for the sport because you help the sport so lot, uh, mostly in North America. It's uh, very appreciated. And have you ever thought about writing other book uh, after Relentless Forward Progress? I know you collaborate on the um, other book too, but uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, Megan, my wife started... and I co-wrote a book, kind of a guide to trail running. Yeah. Um, yes, the answer is yes. I've thought about it. I don't know what it would be. I've had lots of people ask me to put out a, a book of photographs. Uh, <laughs> I don't consider myself a photographer, so that feels strange. Uh, but I could see maybe a book that mixes uh, photography and either personal anecdotes or kind of lessons from the road. I know it when I run far, when I was going to my 10th anniversary of I Run Far, I did have an idea of kind of putting out a 10th anniversary book, and it would have been that. It would have been sharing my experiences, but also what I've learned from traveling the world for all these years and sharing photos from those times. But I don't know, like there's lots of different things I could write. Uh, always welcome to have people throw out ideas. I think, I don't know what would come next, whether it would be a second edition of Relentless Forward Progress or an entirely, entirely new book. Okay. But there'll so probably be another book someday. <laughs> Okay, cool. So, um, what is the best place to follow you? Um, I would say the two places I'm most active these days are uh, my personal Facebook page or profile or whatever you officially call it. Uh, I'm already maxed out on friends. I keep someday I should just make that to be a a page. Uh, but for right now, my personal I run or Brian Powell profile. Uh, and Strava, I've, I run every day and I post on it every day and I share photos and I share my feelings and thoughts. And, uh, yeah, I'd say those are the two best places to follow me. And I have my column on, I run far pretty much every month. Yeah. Which, uh, is very much just what I'm thinking. And that could be some big idea on the sport, but it could just be also, what I've been running. Maybe it's a return to my roots and like just having a personal running blog. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, uh, Brian, thanks a lot again for your all your collaboration on the sport and and your book that I still have as, as a <laughs> great reference. And thanks a lot for your time that you take it just before your traveling trip. So it was a big pleasure to have you on the podcast. It was a big pleasure to join you. Thank you so much for having me.